right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Join me in prayer as we get started. Jesus, you are good, and that is the one thing we know. It's the one thing we need to know, and it is more than enough to simply know that you are good and that you are here and you desire our hearts to be knit with your own. I pray for today, let you give me words to speak and that if anything is not of you, that it it would be quickly forgotten. Um, But the Lord, that you would speak uh, through myself and Holy Spirit, that you would ultimately be the one to teach us all things as you promise in your word. Lord, we love you, and we acknowledge that that is only possible because you have first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to thank uh, Pastor Bill. Um, he gave me, uh, for giving me a chance to come back and speak. It's always wonderful to come back uh, to, uh, to home base, if you will, to where we were sent out from. Uh, so thank you, uh, Pastor Bill, for that opportunity. Um, we still get together. Uh, we had gotten together every few months, and then COVID happened, and yeah, COVID happened. We can all relate to that. Uh, and so we finally got together back in April, and I uh, got to catch up and have some lunch together, and he gave me the invite to come back and preach, and so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, one thing that's really awesome to come back and see is a bunch of people I don't know, <laughs> because what that means is that there are more people uh, who are coming and seeing and tasting that the Lord is good and being part of a family of faith. Uh, and that's just, uh, it's encouraging for me to see. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it is for, for you as well. It's always a good thing when you're part of a church family and there's people that you don't know because <laughs> then you can get to know them and welcome them in. So I, uh, I very much love that. Um, also, I love to walk around, but I, was, I'm gonna, I think I have uh, this area, as I'm told, so if I get off the stage, just give me funny looks, and I'll get back on the stage, Um, so we'll we'll go with that. Uh, So because there's many of you that I don't know, I'll just, uh, and some of you kind of came in, or maybe you're logging in online, I'll just um, give another little introduction of who I am, who is this strange person up here speaking. Uh, My name is Asa, and um, my wife Rachel and our four kids are here in the middle there. Uh, Oh yeah, I have one up here with Mama Joyce. Uh, so I was born and raised in Niagara Falls, New York, uh, for my whole life until I moved away uh, in, uh, to come to Jersey. My wife Rachel, uh, as mentioned before, she grew up right here in Magnolia and grew up in this church when it was uh, called Berean uh, back in the day. And now we have four children, Lisette and Malachi, Ayla and Elijah. It's not often that we have two Elijahs in the same room, which is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, we have, let me see, we came here, I came to Berean uh, when it was uh, back in 2010 to, after I graduated college to uh, serve in the youth ministry. Uh, 2015 came around, I think it was the end of 2015, and the Lord was stirring the waters, if you will, uh, in uh, both the leadership team here and in my heart uh, to work with a church plant uh, in Deptford, just down the road, uh, called Legacy 242. And uh, why are there numbers in the name of a church? Good question. We'll get to that uh, later on here. Um, but that's a little bit of an update of, of who I am. Uh, we also have uh, Mackenzie uh, sitting with us. He's uh, part of the, the house church that we lead in Runnymede. And so excited, excited to have him here with us as well. So we're going to dive into the Word of God uh, just for briefly. Um, and uh, if you want to get your Bibles open, uh, we're going to be in the book of John Uh, just as you're kind of getting your Bibles ready. Two passages in John chapter 11 and John chapter 1 in that order. Uh, So to start off with, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what what is the bad news in your life? Which is a great way to start a sermon about encouragement. (laughs) What is the darkness? What is, where is the death? and the brokenness in your life? What is the bad news? Perhaps what has been the bad news recently, maybe a dark time that you're walking through white right now. What is the difficulty that seems to be lurking around the corner and you're just waiting for it to come? 
I mean, there's all kinds of things, right? We live in the COVID world, so some of you felt absolutely crushed when quarantine happened because you needed that, that uh, interaction. Our, who, who, where's our extroverts in the room? You guys probably had a really tough time with that. Others of you felt utterly crushed now that things are opening back up, and now you have to re-engage uh, a busy schedule and so forth. Now, I am in the latter group. <laughs> But it could be any, any number of things, right? Could be uh, things at work are not what you would like them to be, a dead-end career, a boss that doesn't get you, you just feel like you need a change. Or you could be the boss who has employees who don't like you and don't do what they're asked. You could feel squeezed. It could be a marriage that's just lost the spark. There's no love left could be a, a child who's made some poor choices and you feel kind of helpless. It could be your finances are just in shambles and you're not sure which way is going to be up, which way is going to be down, or how you're going to get food on the table. It could be a friendship that you wish was mutual, but isn't. It could be your parents who just don't get it. It could be really any number of things. It could be your faith even. It could be your faith that you just feel like there's this distance between you and God. And you just, you can't get your hand on it. It could be things with like anxiety or depression. Maybe you're suffering from that. Maybe there's a, a trauma in your life that just won't go away. There's a wound that just won't let up and won't heal. Maybe it's just regrets. You look back on your life and you say, man, I woulda, coulda, shoulda. And you live with this darkness and we don't, we don't do anything about it. We plaster a smile on our face. We turn that frown upside down. Pretend like everything's okay. And the, the, the death inside of us is festering behind the tombstone. Uh, personally, I'm there right now. You know, I, I got together with Bill back in, what was it, April, I believe, and he asked if I would preach, and I said, logistically, it wasn't going to work out, but also I said, hey, can I just do the end of May, and thinking that maybe I'd be in a better spot, and the Lord said, no, I'm going to have you preach from your brokenness. perhaps you can relate to some of these things. I mean, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Like, you, there's this thing called margin in life, and then when you exceed the margin for long enough and you live in crisis mode long enough, uh, it starts to have manifestations in your life. It starts to affect you. You know, feeling that just depleted, like you don't have anything left to offer anyone. You know, anxiety, I've, I've realized, creeps up like a weed and for me, my story is I feel like I have to do more, try harder, work harder, do enough, be good enough, make everyone else happy enough around me so that I can feel like I have some worth and value as a human. And of course, there's a lot behind that. You have the, here's, here's, here's what we can level together. You have your story and I have mine. We all have a story that has a common ground of brokenness and darkness and death and rotten things. And here's the problem. You see, we recognize it to some degree. To one degree or another, we recognize it. We may not always be able to put our finger on it, but we recognize it's there. And we oftentimes feel like we're on our own. Whether by choice, but we just can't bring ourselves to talk about it, or maybe, it, maybe there's this uh, kind of silent rule in your home that we don't talk about problems. We don't talk about things that are hard. Emotions are bad. They should just go away. You should just make everything be okay and happy. That's very common in our culture. But then we let it kind of seep into our faith, how faith and life interact. And we feel like we function as if we are orphans without a heavenly father who cares. We function as if no one sees us. 
And I don't, when I say the word see, I don't mean the optic nerve. <laughs> I mean really seeing the pain. We feel like we're on our own. And so, recently I was reading through the book of John. I haven't read through John all the way through in years. Read through it recently, and two things really stuck out. Two instances where the same phrase was used. The phrase, come and see. And we're going to go through both of those instances because I want to encourage you today that whatever brokenness you're carrying or are anticipating, (laughs) there is someone who sees you. There is someone who gets it. And we're going to see this in in the book of John. So join me in John chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 28 and go through 44. We're going to jump in the middle of a situation. I'll give you a little context and then I'll read the passage. Uh, But this first kind of uh, point, there's really just two points today in this this little sermonette really, uh, that Jesus desires to come and see you. So let's read it together. Pick it up in verse 28. Context is Jesus is coming to this town of Bethany where his uh, good friend Lazarus was sick and then eventually uh, died. And Lazarus' his sister, uh, Martha, is running out to meet Jesus as he's coming into town. Uh, and then, after a brief interaction, uh, Martha runs home to get her, her sister, Mary. And this is where we're going to pick it up in verse 28. When she, Martha, had said this, she went and called her sister, Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly to go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb of her brother, right, to weep there. Now when Mary came to see Jesus, uh, where where he was, and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had just been here, My brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Now that's going to raise some eyebrows. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, uh, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they might believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the man who had died (laughs) <laughs> came out. His hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. <laughs> I mean, other than the fact that this is just straight up crazy, if you had been there. Let's just talk about this for a second. I think that, really two, two things to talk about here. One, in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our utter darkness, 
I think sometimes we might have the tendency to have a certain blindness about us. Kind of blind to what's going on. We might be, I would even say, confused over who God is, what God's doing, what God could have done, perhaps what God should have done, in our opinion, and from our perspective. Just like Martha and Mary and the, and the Jewish folks who were consoling them. Surely he could have kept this man from dying. Lord, if you just come, now if you read the whole context of John chapter 11, you would know that Jesus purposely stayed behind and let his friend die. I don't have enough time to preach on all that. But do you ever feel like you, you know God is able, but you're just, you feel confused. You feel conflicted in your heart about the person and the activity of God in your life. And you wonder if he actually sees you. Like you might theologically know, because I know you're all smart people, but sometimes our functional theology differs from our mental theology. But do you see how Jesus responded? Greatly moved, not once, but twice. Troubled. Weeping. Do you see your Savior weeping over the dead things in your life? Now, exegetically, or in other words, directly what's from the text, this is about Jesus going to his friend's funeral, well, post-funeral, and raising him from the dead. But I can't help but look at this and see that there's something here that what if... What are the parts in your life that are dead and rotten and bound and quite frankly stink by this point because the trauma has festered for so long? But you hide in a cave behind a tombstone so that no one sees it because that's the right thing to do or so they say. Now I'm not saying you don't observe social tact (laughs) but We also can't lie to ourselves about the junk that's really going on. And do you know what happened here? My my prayer for, as I've been dealing with darkness myself, has been, Lord, come and see. Come and see the broken depletion, the stress, the overwhelmedness, the anxiety. Come and see the rottenness that's been festering in my soul. And sometimes when you roll that tombstone away and you actually start to deal with it, oh, it stinks. Decomposition is not a good thing. But this is the good news. This is the good news of Jesus. He says, Where has the body been laid? Where is the death in your life? I want to see it. I want to heal it. I want to, not just that, I want to resurrect it. I want to bring resurrection power to you. As Paul says in Philippians chapter three, he says, I pursue this resurrection of Christ. I pursue this resurrection life. I pursue, I want my life to be reflecting that Jesus has risen again and risen me to newness of life. That I can live differently, not running from the brokenness and the pain and the death, but letting Jesus transform it, renew it, resurrect it so that I can then live for him. Let's head over to John chapter 1. Because not only can, does Jesus desire to come and see you, but in John chapter 1, verses 43 to 49, we can invite others to come and see the God who sees them. John chapter 1, verses 43 to the end here. But we're going to really, we're just going to stop it at 49 just for the sake of time. This is, uh, this is early in Jesus. We went from the end of, or towards the end of Jesus' ministry back to the beginning. 
and Jesus is gathering his disciples around him and so forth. So we're going to pick it up in verse 43 of John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, you got to be kidding me. Okay, that's, I'm adding that part. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, it's Hodunk town. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God and the King of Israel. Well, there's a difference. <laughs> you go from practically making fun of the guy to declaring him the Messiah. <laughs> Clearly, Nathanael was deeply moved, was significantly impacted by the fact that Jesus said, I saw you. I mean, Philip invited Nathaniel to come and see the Savior. I, I, I personally really enjoy, there's like a series online called The Chosen, and then it had, there's an episode all about Nathaniel and how, because growing up in Sunday school, I always figured, well, how, I, Jesus probably just walked by, saw one of the fig tree and walked on, and why would that be significant? Um, but thinking through how this might have went down, something, regardless of how it happened, it radically flipped Nathaniel's life upside down. <laughs> the fact that there is a God who saw him. And it was because his friend Philip said, come and see. So we can inv- not only can, can we invite Jesus to come and see us, but then we can also invite others to, c- to come and see that there's a God who sees them. Just like you have your story of brokenness, your story of death, your story of being bound, your story of having rottenness behind the the tombstone, perhaps there are others that you know that are in the same boat. Different story, but broken nevertheless. That might need you to come alongside of them and as one person puts it, sing the gospel to them because they're not strong enough to do it on their own right now. I mean, between my wife Rachel and Mika, uh, Mackenzie, um, there's been plenty of times in the last some, some, uh, several months that I've had nothing left. Nothing. Reduced to tears or rage. And they have faithfully spoken and sung the gospel over me. I'm supposed to be a pastor who has it all together. (laughs) Doesn't matter who you are or how put together your life, you try to make your life look like. You need someone to sing the gospel over you, the good news that Jesus is here and he cares and he sees you. And not just, again, not just with the optic nerves, he sees into you intimately and cares about what's going on inside. And so these, these two points, really this is a good transition into a ministry update um, because this is really the, the, the outline of how uh, of how we do church <laughs> uh, in, in the, in the, in the house, tr- house church format. So we're going to go over that, but it's this concept of we gather together as believers and encourage each other, hey, how does God see you? And where, where are the dead spots within you that the Lord desires to bring healing to and victory to? I mean, shoot, the Apostle Paul had a thorn in his side that just bugged him to no end. So if the Apostle Paul has something, I'm sure we all do too. (laughs) 
So we, as a body of, of a faith family, come together and, and uh, can encourage each other, and then, then we just go out and see if there's other people who might need the gospel sung over them, that they might need to be say, hey, come and see. Come and see. It's not me who does the saving. I'm no savior, but I can show you who he is. <laughs> That's kind of the outline of, of how we do things uh, in church, uh, so to speak. So if you're, uh, well, I'll start with kind of high level. Uh, the church plant, although it's not really much of a plant anymore, it's five, six years old, but um, it's called Legacy 242, and some of you were here when we were sent out to work with them, but if you were not, here's just a reminder of what the mission and vision are, just a, a real quick overview. Um, in Legacy 242, the mission is kind of uh, basically the Great Commission of Jesus just put into a mission statement, uh, is to help more people meet Jesus, experience life change, and follow him, right? We want people to come to that point where they see that Jesus the, uh, is the Savior, is their rescuer, who will flip their life around and they can be his disciple, right? Um, the vision, like kind of where we're going, this is where the name of the church and why in the world there's numbers in the name of a church, um, is this, to see God build a lasting legacy of love in South Jersey, much like they did in the first century church, as you see in Acts 2.42. So hence, legacy 2.42. Uh, and so the way it's kind of set up is uh, a network of house churches, which is a little bit different. Uh, it's, there's some folks who simply won't set foot in a church building ever. Uh, and so uh, we need to be doing everything we can to reach anyone, right? So whether it's in a church building, whether it's not in a church building or in someone's backyard, whatever. <laughs> like the, the methodology is l- not much important as much as long as we reach people. And that is where we have common ground. We're reaching the same people group of South Jersey. I mean, this is South Jersey. You could almost uh, throw a rock and hit my house <laughs> from here. We're just uh, up in Runnymede. Uh, some of you live in Runnymede. <laughs> so um, we're reaching the same people group, just using different methods uh, so as uh, to, to reach some, right? And so uh, there's four different house churches, one in Westfield, Deptford, Belmar, and Runnymede. The home base is in Deptford, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so, of course, we lead the church in the house church in Runnymede. Uh, and so just give you a couple updates on what's going on. Uh, what we do, we meet every Thursday, which took a while to get used to going church on Thursday evening. That's just weird. I, I don't know if that'll ever get used, I'll ever get used to that. Um, but we, that's what we do. Um, and we, uh, Thursday evenings. And we basically have this concept of, we're gonna, uh, we kind of call it gather and scatter. Uh, there are times when we are together as a body and we're, uh, someone's either teaching. Uh, sometimes we have a discussion around the word. Uh, we haven't done communion a lot because of COVID, but um, we need to get back into that. Uh, but there's just times of encouraging each other and really you know, speaking the gospel into each other's lives. Uh, but then there's other weeks where we scatter, where we go to say, hey, come and see. And that could look like anything. That could look like um, uh, going to the laundromat. There's two laundromats in Runnymede. So, all right, everyone bring some cash and we're going to see if we can bless people and pray with them. And there's been some really neat conversations that came out of that. Uh, there's been things like uh, going, going out and just doing some good old-fashioned door knocking. COVID has been like a wonderful opportunity. Get your mask, get your gloves, knock, knock, knock. All right, six feet. All right, now we're good. And <laughs> hey, do you need anything? Can, I, can we pray for you? Um, doing a lot of training as far as the folks who are part of it. Uh, part of the Run and Meet Church to how do you share the gospel? <laughs> how do you do this? How do you share your testimony? How do you uh, be genuine with people uh, and not just act like a salesman? Um, and so there's, there's been that. It's been really, really neat. Um, there's been coming out of COVID uh, Zoom church and we kind of just started coming back in person and that's been wonderful that there's like a healthy church community to, to have as you guys are, are, are enjoying as well. Uh, there's been, a, there's a, an apartment complex that's near us that we've just started knocking on all the doors and, and uh, just seeing if we can meet practical needs because it would be a, 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 a situation where um, there would naturally be plenty of need. Uh, and so, I mean, shoot, there's been um, Maribel who has been just a, a joy to get to know. Um, and one of the people in our church has kind of adopted her. Uh, she moved, she has since moved closer to home and, um, the family, one of the families in our church just kind of continues to stay in contact and encourage her in the Lord. Um, we had one guy, Antonio, who was kind of like the, um, you know, the one guy in the apartment that knew everyone. <laughs> and so we were able to sit on his front stoop. And I uh, remember we would just go through Ephesians one time. We just went through a chapter in Ephesians just 
shooting the breeze, and uh, he did pass away uh, a couple, couple of months ago, so that was definitely sad. Um, I mean, there other folks. There's Walt and Britt, who I, I, you know, I saw him, actually just saw him last week walking down the road, and they just have a ton of need and brokenness and death and pain in their life. Um, and just getting to love on them. Uh, there's one guy, Pete. Uh, we love Pete. Uh, Pete has actually joined our church just, for, just because, I mean, he's told us, I don't have any other friends. Uh, and he was just someone we just knocked on, we happened to knock on his door when, right when he moved into the apartment complex. And um, one of the other families in the church, um, uh, Mark and Susie, uh, they kind of, ad- I don't want to say adopted him, but just welcomed him into their family. And Mark takes Pete to the gym every morning. And, and uh, Sometimes Pete just comes and sits on our back patio and like, oh, okay, hi Pete. <laughs> I guess you're over here. <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, and it's just been wonderful to get to, to see people. You know when Jesus said um, to his disciples in Matthew 25, he said, you know, whatever you do to the least of these you've done to me, uh, looking into the faces of these people and say, I look into your face and I see the face of Christ. And yeah, there are some challenges that can be presented with that. That for the sake of propriety, I won't go into. (laughs) However, it's it's nothing normal, it's nothing uh, crazy, it's nothing abnormal, it's just loving people. You're hurt, you're broken. What would Jesus do, right? WWGD. What would Jesus do? Jesus would love you. That's what Jesus would do. No matter how weird or uncomfortable it might be. Um, there's also a group called Reimagine Runnymede uh, in, in town uh, that we kind of are part of as a way to get into the community. Uh, so actually the third Thursday of every month, uh, we don't have like a regular gathering. Our gathering is to go to the Reimagine Runnymede meeting <laughs> in town. Uh, and I've gotten to know the president of that group. And I'll tell you what, it's just, it, it, he actually told me recently, he said, man, this, this Reimagine Runnymede group is nice and fun, but I'm just really glad it was a catalyst so we could become friends. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you what, there's, he is also going through a very, very dark time in his life, very difficult, uh, as, as I am as well. Um, and so we, we have a very, oh, very open conversation. We've laughed together. We've cried together. Um, very open like, dialogue of faith in life. He hasn't really engaged his faith much since he was a kid. Um, and, you know, I'm going to kind of pray for you, you know, and so forth. And then, and then uh, we were talking on the phone about a month ago, and he said, hey, can I p- try praying for you? I haven't done it in a while. I'm, I'm a little bit rusty. <laughs> yes, yeah, I would, I would love if you would pray for me. Uh, and this is just kind of a funny story. And then uh, later on that day, it, like, er, er, the whole, the ceiling, the floor came out from under me. It was just an extremely hard day. Um, and he, he actually texted me to check in, how you doing? And I said, well, not so good. He's like, oh man, did my prayer backfire? <laughs> 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 no, no, it didn't backfire. In fact, that was probably the most encouraging part of my day is when you prayed for me. Because there's like, I love it when people who don't know how to pray or the, don't have the words, there's no presumptuousness. They just talk to God. And it is wonderful. I love that. Um, and so just to have these, we're just going to be part of the community. But I say these things not because, these are all the fun stories, the good stories. Um, we've also gone to Philly. One day, one of the people, they've never done it before, I'd like, let's just go to Philly and just find people. And you know what? Some people yeah, feel one way or feel another way about doing that. Um, but I'm like, hey, Jesus loved people and went to them, so let's do it too. Uh, so went to Philly, and these people have no idea what, what to do. Um, but we talked about it, you, little, you kind of prepared them, and they just wanted to love people, just sit down on the pavement, uh, you know, by, uh, by Reading Terminal Market or wherever, and just, we're just going to talk. And all kinds of like, personalities come out. That's part of our scattering. We'll just pick a day, and we're just going to go out and love people. I'm saying all this because, uh, well, first off, there's been a lot of days and things haven't worked right. <laughs> but I also say it because, we're not doing anything crazy or inventive or super creative. It's just, where are the people and how can we love them? How can we love them well and how can we just share our life with them and share the gospel with them and just love them? And you know what? We've probably been rejected more times than we've not been rejected. <laughs> but it's things that you can do too. And 
I know you have like small groups and so forth, and this is, I want to kind of say this to kind of maybe get the juices flowing of how you can invite others to come and see the God who sees them. Uh, there's a couple other things. Uh, I'll kind of end with this on more of an international level. Um, in, in our particular house church in Runnymede, uh, we've kind of gotten friendly with uh, Ben Walela uh, from Katali, Kenya. The guy on the left there is Jack. Ben is on the right. Um, Jack, we kind of know through a network that our church is part of, and uh, he's an RIT student, and so he would go over there. He went over there about two years ago and met up with uh, some believers and just started making disciples and just training them how to make disciples themselves, right? Uh, and how to continue to make disciples. And I mean, long story short, there's just been hundreds of people coming to know Jesus. Um, I'm, it's almost to the point where I'm like, okay, more baptism pictures, <laughs> you know, which is like pretty cool. I guess I'm not, not really. I'm very, very excited every time. A um, little jealous, <laughs> not, not going to lie to you. Um, that's cool. So a lot of what they, their needs are that we've kind of met alongside is obviously just prayer for them and uh, getting to te- text him back and forth. I mean, Ben's, you know, probably in his late 20s, getting to talk to him over uh, the internet. And, um, I mean, some of the things that to help out financially, we just kind of like pitch money into the pot and see, hey, they need a motorcycle. To, and they all share a motorcycle to take the gospel to villages where they couldn't walk to. So, like, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, and buying Bibles. Like, <laughs> actually, they, they've... Uh, Lots of people come to know Jesus, and now they're, those people are starting to go to neighboring Uganda and just like, we're going to go make disciples there. And so they've been doing that. And actually, Jack just got back from uh, a trip, his second trip out there, to help Ben and, and the leadership team there make disciples in Uganda. And they th- sent me a picture. They bought out every Bible from like three different Bible stores, <laughs> from uh, bookstores. And uh, so I was texting Ben last week and, hey, you know, what are your needs? How can we pray? He's like, well, hey, pray for the church in Katali, Kenya, and the surrounding areas, and for the, the kind of the baby church in Uganda, uh, and all these people, and to pray that they would grow and be strengthened, uh, and uh, we need more Bibles. <laughs> like, Dude, you need more Bibles? How many? Like 150. What? <laughs> 150 more? Okay, fine. Um, so that's, uh, we just love to be a part of that. Um, keep it in mind for prayer points for like, how can I pray? Well, pray for Ben. Pray for these people who in Africa who are like, just got saved two years ago and lo- just loving making disciples all over the place. Um, and then another one that we're involved in, uh, somewhat more so the Deptford Church, uh, and that's Steve. He's the lead pastor of Legacy uh, 242, but uh, there's a, a church planter named Sunit Rate uh, who's in uh, Raipur, India, and uh, we've gotten, same thing, it's sort of just uh, how can we pray with you? How can we provide Bibles for you? And and so forth and so on. But there's some definite uh, current things. If you have kept up, India is not doing well. Um, I think there have been 25, uh, 17 pastors who have passed away due to COVID. And then of them, uh, seven more have lost someone in their immediate family due to COVID. It's just not good. Um, and also a ton of persecution from the Hindu government. Um, super difficult to be a Christian there. Uh, so... That's, uh, that's Sunit, um, but they had like, I think, I think last time we checked in, it was like 80 folks this year who have just come to know Jesus, and it's all done in secret and all this stuff. Um, it's not so secretive that uh, I do have permission to say the names out loud. I did confirm that first, um, but uh, it's, it's not easy being a Christian, and one of the things, that one of their goals is to uh, build a, uh, or run a Bible school by the end of the year, and they're uh, well on their way to doing that. So just some prayer points. Um, uh, to think through. I'm just trying to end to kind of summarize everything. Uh, we have uh, to how you could be praying for us, and I really do covet your prayers. I mean, to, to lift up my family, the Sturdivant family, uh, especially as we're walking just through uh, the valley of the shadow of death, if you will, um, presently for the past, uh, past few months, um, just to lift us up in prayer that we would be encouraged in the Lord and, um, and so forth. Uh, you could be praying for the Runnymede House Church uh, that we would stay faithful to the mission that uh, God has for us to just, whoever God puts on our path, to just be faithful to love them well, regardless of the response. Um, you can be praying for Legacy 242 and as a whole, it's uh, the different house churches around um, the Belmar, Deptford, uh, Runnymede, and, of, and uh, Westville. Just be praying for, for us to continue to have uh, our eyes laser focused on reaching the towns around us. And also for Ben Sunit, um, you know, just if you're thinking internationally, hey, uh, just that, that the, the disciple-making movement in 
uh, Kenya kind of pouring over into Uganda uh, would just be, uh, just continue, the Spirit would continue to move and bring people to uh, the Father uh, as well as in um, India well, just with uh, prayers for protection for Sunit and his family and um, not only from COVID but also from uh, the government <laughs> uh, and that they would be lights in India uh, amidst the darkness. So, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, just hanging in there with me and, and I love just to get to share this stuff with you and hopefully it was an encouragement to you and you can maybe take some ideas and maybe be a little bit inspired to uh, do some of these things in your own community. Uh, what's going on in the community around you? How can you love well? And I know you guys are already doing things, but how can we just continue to be inventive? I think God's up to something. I just see, I see it happening, and I'm very excited to see that. I'm excited to know how Milestone is going to be involved in that process, because really we're linking arms. We're, we have the same exact mission field, <laughs> so, so I'm very excited for that. Um, so join me in prayer, and then I'll, I'll hand it back off to Pastor Bill. Uh, God, you are good. Again, I said it, I just can't say it enough to say that you are good, to confess with my mouth that you are the master, you are the one who loves us, you are the one who, whose kindness leads us to repentance. And so we thank you for that. I, I do pray for, uh, for Ben and for Sunit and, and just the, the, the challenges and the joys that they're facing, that you would continue to move uh, in the harvest field in those areas. Lord, I pray for this harvest area of South Jersey that you would uh, till the field and you would work through us to do that. Lord, keep us uh, persevering uh, amidst the, hmm, the, cold, the spiritual coldness that seems to still have a, a death grip on this, on this area. Lord, I pray and we, we trust and we confess that you are able to melt the heart of stone here in South Jersey. And so we trust you to do that. Uh, we love you again as always thank you for loving us first in Jesus name amen